Hey there students, I tell you what, I was reading through the comments a couple days ago and somebody commented on my Louis XIV video, hey, where's that video on the Divine Right of Kings? And I was thinking, hey, didn't I promise that maybe like four years ago? I was like, this video's coming soon. Never put it out there, but now it's here. Gonna talk about the Divine Right of Kings and a quick shout out to Miss Davis's students at Princess Anne High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Your teacher is a queen and you should be thankful that God gave her to you to teach UAP Euro. So let's go ahead and talk about the divine right of kings. Really what's at stake here? The question that we're asking is from where does a king draw his authority? And the divine right of kings answers that kings are ordained by God, that God gives power to the king and the king rules over the people on God's behalf. This is a top-down approach to government as opposed to social contract theory, which says that governments are created by society so that if a king or any government's created that that government's power comes from the people and so this is in direct conflict okay this is a bottom-up approach the social contract is bottom up the divine right of kings is top down okay so the social contract is not divine right uh social contract bottom up divine right of kings top down down. And so as far as the theory of the divine right of kings, we're looking at Jacques Bossuet, Louis XIV's court preacher. Now, of course, Louis XIV, for obvious reasons, big fan of the divine right of kings. And so Bossuet, who I might call Bossuet because let's face it, it's a written test, right? And I don't want you misspelling it or anything like that. So God establishes kings as his ministers and reigns through them over the people. That comes from his politics derived from sacred scripture. And he uses the Bible in order to give authority and weight to this argument for the divine right of kings. He says, how be it the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler, and of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord hath given me many sons, he hath chosen Solomon my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Now, of course, it's like I'm the king right now and then Solomon's going after me. And it's all because God said so. Never mind that Solomon uh, killed some of his siblings and that sort of thing. And, you know, David, uh, you know, had a bit of a reign of blood as well. But everything's the way it is because God said so. And I am king because... God said so. Now, of course, this was not original to King David. Uh, all the way back to Hammurabi's code, Hammurabi is using the language of divine right, that God or the gods have put this ruler here. But Basue is using this biblical evidence to show that God intended for kings to reign on his behalf. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Now that's from Romans, that's St. Paul, that if you don't listen to the divinely appointed authorities, then you are going to be damned. Damned. Let them be anathema, as the Council of Trent would say it, right? So rebellion against the king is rebellion against God. Now, just a little aside, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a poem that he called The Divine Right of Kings and uses a lot of uh, language that I think just kind of drives home what this is. And it's a great poem, so great that I actually have it memorized. So I'm just going to go ahead and recite it for you real quick, if you'll allow me. Is that okay? I hope that's okay, because I'm just going to go ahead and recite it. The only king by right divine is Ellen King, and were she mine. I'd strive for liberty no more, but hug the glorious chains I wore. Her bosom is an ivory throne where tyrant virtue reigns alone. No subject vice dare interfere to check the power that governs here. Oh, would she deign to rule my fate, I'd worship kings in kingly state and hold this maxim all life long, the king 
my king can do no wrong. Now, we see the language of the divine right of kings here in this poem. I'd strive for liberty no more. Tyrant virtue. Now, tyrant virtue we'll talk about in a second that, you know, it's not like tyranny, but it's the power of a tyrant to be used virtuously, as we'll discuss in a second. No subject vice dare interfere to check the power, okay? So absolutism, uh, divine right absolutism, does not recognize checks on the power of this divinely appointed monarch. The king, my king, can do no wrong. Now, James I of England was a major proponent of divine right absolutism. He said to Parliament in 1610, King Kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth and sit upon God's throne, but even by God himself they are called gods. And so their power, after a certain relation, compared to the divine power. Okay, so it's almost like God sees that king and he's like, I will call you mini-me. You know, they're just like little mini-gods, and they're just, you know, it's like, look, they're like little God Jr., his lieutenants, and they're out there doing God's work. That's what a king does. Now, the other side of that, as I was mentioning from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, Tyrant Virtue, that there are also reciprocal obligations. With this authority comes responsibility. Just as God is the father of creation, the king must be the father of his country and must look after the country as he would look after his own children that God has given him. And James wrote in The True Law of Free Monarchies, also called by the longer title, I think the original title, the reciprocal and mutual duty betwixt a free king and his natural subjects. Okay, so the king is free to do what he wants, but not really because he's subject to the law of God. God will stir up such scourges, punishments, as pleaseth him for punishment of wicked king. Okay, so God is not going to be okay if a king is wicked. That person is going to have to face something later. Divine judgment will await any king who does not discharge his obligations as a little mini-god or whatever, a lieutenant. He will have to answer to God for the way that he has ruled. And so really, if there's any check on the power of the king, then that is that there is going to be hell to pay, literally, if a king does not govern as God would want. And this is where we think about Louis XIV, another proponent of divine right absolutism, one king, one law, one faith, okay? Now, why one faith? Why did Louis XIV revoke the Edict of Nantes? Now, for one thing, Louis XIV may have revoked the Edict of Nantes because that consolidated his own power. That made him more of an authority and brought the nation more under his rule. But let's also consider this in light of the divine right of kings. When Louis revoked the Edict of Nantes, he proclaimed, we have determined that we can do nothing better in order wholly to obliterate the memory of the troubles, the confusion, and the evils which the progress of this false religion has caused in this kingdom than entirely to revoke the said Edict of Nantes. So the reformed Protestant religion as Louis saw it was a false religion and when Louis arrives at the judgment seat of Christ he doesn't want to be asked Louis, why did you allow your people to proclaim this false religion? Bad little god lieutenant uh, you know, not worthy of being a mini-me, or anything like that. So let's not forget the role of the divine right of kings in this decision. So one thing, I think it deserves a counterpoint. We think about absolutism in the Bible or monarchy in the Bible. Uh, that we, you know, Thomas Paine, uh, of course, from an enlightenment perspective, gives us an anti-monarchy kind of point of view, but also from the Bible. All right, and Thomas Paine, who was a deist, wasn't even a Christian, is using the Bible because his audience, in, in common sense, which was written in order to persuade Americans to reject monarchy, he goes back to some biblical scenes from the Old Testament really before this, uh, you know, all happened, before the Israelites had a monarchy. Thomas Paine wrote in common sense, monarchy is the popery of government. Now, remember, he's writing to a largely Protestant audience 
Protestant, so he was using some of the language of the anti-Catholic bigotry that was the norm in the English colonies of that time. Going back to the book of Judges and the story of Gideon, he points out in scripture where it said, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now also, when the Israelites asked Samuel for a king, Yahweh was not very happy, and Samuel communicated on Yahweh's behalf as his prophet that you know, Yahweh's not too happy with this. The people all said to Samuel, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die, for we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. And so as far as this goes, we can see as much evidence in the Bible against monarchy as for. Just like on a lot of other things, the Bible is unclear. So let's go back and do a quick review. Now, first of all, the main theorist of the divine right of kings is Bossuet, or Bossuet if you're an English speaker taking a test. Let's face it, French is a hard language. He presents a biblical basis for absolutism. So he's using sacred scripture in order to say that divine right absolutism is the way to go. That's what God wants. And this is a top-down kind of way of doing things. Remember, this is not the social contract, all right? So the social contract, bottom-up, absolutism, top-down, God, king, people, not people making whatever government they choose to make. And your main proponents as far as the royals here, you've got Louis XIV of France, James I of England, and Charles I of England, who of course uh, you know, has his head cut off in the English Civil War, and that's the end of absolutism in England. So funny how I've got these, these pictures because Louis looks shorter than these guys, but then again, Louis XIV was kind of a short guy, so maybe that's maybe that's fitting. But if you'll remember Bossuet, Louis XIV, James I, Charles I, and the basic premise of the divine right of kings, which of course is repudiated in the glorious revolution uh, when William III and Mary come in and they reign as joint monarchs and John Locke publishes his two treatises of government advocating constitutionalism. And so that's that for that lecture, ladies and gentlemen. I know that one was long overdue and I will have some other lectures coming soon. If I've promised another lecture, y'all let me know. I'll get to it forthwith. Remember, subscribe if you haven't already. Follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff, at Tom Ritchie. And I tell you what, it's always a pleasure.